I am Greg Whitcup, Director of the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. I want to welcome you to our special holiday program brought to you by the Center and our friends at Cranbrook House and Gardens Auxiliary. The Center is charged with preserving the architecture, landscape, and objects that define Cranbrook's National Historic Landmark Campus. Collectively, they create an extraordinary total work of art. These objects that make up Cranbrook are not just beautiful and useful, however, they carry extra meaning for the stories embedded within them. These stories of the people behind the collections are what bring Cranbrook to life. 101 years ago, George and Ellen Booth and their family celebrated Christmas in the newly completed Oak Room of Cranbrook House. While the library, which had, been, which had been completed a year earlier, was the setting for the family's largest gatherings, especially those that included friends and associates from around the region and often the nation, the Oak Room is where the family celebrated their most intimate events, including birthdays and engagements. Many of these special events in the lives of our founders and the larger Cranbrook community, both intimate and grand, were marked with the creation of a cartouche. Painted on one of the panels that run along the top of the oak paneling in the oak room. For the past few weeks, Center Curator Kevin Atkinson, working with Associate Archivist Laura McNewman and Archives Assistant Meredith Counts, has researched and gathered together stories that tell us about these cartouches, beginning with the Christmas the Booth celebrated in the Oak Room in December 1920. Thank you for taking the time to join us today for what regretfully is another unusual holiday season. Your ticket price for today's program goes directly to supporting the work of both the Center for Collections and Research and the House and Gardens Auxiliary. I now would like to introduce the chair of the auxiliary, Helen Mayman. Helen, my colleagues and I at the Center are delighted to be able to collaborate with you and the Auxiliary on this and other events throughout the year. The virtual podium is all yours. Thank you, Greg, and thank you all for joining us today. It is my honor to serve as chair of Cranbrook House and Gardens Auxiliary, as Greg mentioned. The Auxiliary is dedicated to preserving, restoring, and maintaining Cranbrook House and Gardens. This year, we are celebrating 50 years of service to Cranbrook. Over the last five decades, we've been able to share Cranbrook House and the story of the Booth family on our tours. And we've also been able to welcome countless visitors to Cranbrook Gardens, offer plant sales, embark on restoration projects and more. This would not be possible without the support of guests like you who join us at events like these. Thank you for being part of our 50th anniversary. The House and Gardens Auxiliary is pleased to collaborate with Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research on this virtual experience. Today we will be sharing with you special stories from Cranbrook's founders, George Goff Booth and Ellen Scripps Booth, and stories of important Cranbrook educational community milestones. Center Curator Kevin Atkinson will be guiding us around the Cranbrook House Oak Room, highlighting select cartouches and notable stories and objects from the Founders' personal collection. Along the way, we will hear from Cranbrook House and Gardens Auxiliary Volunteers, Camille Breen, Randy Forrester, and Judy Lindstrom, who will help Kevin share insights into the Booth family traditions and significant events. Without further ado, welcome to Sign and Symbol, the Cranbrook House Oak Room Cartouches. Kevin, take it away. Thank you, Helen, and thank you, Greg. It's wonderful to be with you all this uh, December afternoon. Now, I am here in the Oak Room. You can see the cartouches are a halo around my head. Uh, and today's tour is going to walk us through cartouche to cartouche in the order roughly that they were painted. And this is a very specific and unique way of looking at the history of Cranbrook from about 1910 to the late 1990s. I'm delighted to be joined by my colleagues from the House and Gardens Auxiliary to share with you all uh, these 42 special small paintings, each one between six and eight inches high. 
For the next hour, we'll learn a bit about the history of Cranbrook and our community's founding family, the Booths. Then we'll move into the history of the Oak Room where I'm sitting, and then the dramatic paneling that gives the room its name. The majority of our program will go cartouche to cartouche, learning about the events commemorated in these paintings. But before we get to uh, the cartouches, we do have to learn a bit more about Cranbrook. Cranbrook House was the home of our founding family, uh, uh, the Booth family, George and Ellen Scripps Booth. And I'm sitting on the very far right of this photograph in the Oak Room. The house was built in 1908. The Oak Room was added in 1919 and finished in 1920. You can see these two lovely portraits of our uh, co-founders, Ellen and George. Uh, and above them are some of the cartouches. Now, George Booth was a newspaper man. He had roots in ironwork, uh, making decorative uh, iron railings and, and, and architectural fixtures. Uh, when he married Ellen Scripps, he entered into her family business. Her father had been the founder of the Detroit Evening News. And together, George and Ellen Booth first had a very uh, uh, successful life in business, then they had a very successful family life here on a country estate, and then they set out to form six institutions. And today's lecture is not really the history of Cranbrook, but in order to understand the cartouches, we do have to know what about 1923 George and Ellen started setting up here on what had been a private family estate. First, they opened an elementary school, Brookside, then an Episcopal church, Christ Church Cranbrook. Following that, Cranbrook School for Boys, a preparatory and boarding school for young men, and then Kingswood School for Girls. Then came the Cranbrook Institute of Science, and alongside it, Cranbrook Academy of Art and its glorious art museum. In order to understand our cartouches, it's important that we know these are the six institutions that formed the Cranbrook community, what for many decades was known as the Cranbrook Foundation, today Cranbrook Educational Community. But before all of these six institutions would transform the 300 plus acres of rolling countryside, uh, you had the booths rolling in uh, in horse and buggy to a piece of property that they bought in 1904 that consisted essentially of hard scrabble farmland, some old farm buildings that were falling apart. And here we see our Detroit family moving up to the country. And in the hand of our founder, George Booth, he sketches out a new house on the highest point of this property. He takes this sketch from 1906, and in 1908, the architect Albert Kahn realizes George Booth's initial vision with Cranbrook House. Now, as the family grew, and as the social status and sort of social calendar of George and Ellen Booth grew, so too did the house. And so you see by 1919, the construction on what had been a garage of a new room and these stone windows and brick walls that are being built on the right hand side of your screen. That's the room where I'm sitting in the oak room so that by 1920 you could have pulled up in your car and you would have seen a pretty luxurious manor home here in the countryside. Now, before we get to the addition on the right, the oak room. I want us to focus on the left. This is a 1918 wing, the Cranbrook House Library. And I present this room because this is another example of a wood paneled room and the wood carving done by John Kirschmeyer. The booths were deeply invested in the arts and crafts movement, which was an English uh, 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 art movement that began to expand around the globe, and the arts and crafts movement advocated for fine handicraft, that the best way to live a sort of beautiful and truthful life was to surround yourself with handmade objects that are sort of this anti-industrial revolution ideal. And George Booth conceived of, over his fireplace, a tribute to the arts and crafts movement. And in order to carve this, he turned to an old friend, John Kirschmeyer. Johannes Kirschmeyer uh, was born in Oberammergau, Germany, in Bavaria. He was working at the time he carved this in Boston and was affiliated with the Boston Society of Arts and Crafts, of which George Booth was a member. 
Now, usually on my tours, and I'm sure on the House and Gardens tours as well, we focus on these figures at the center of the overmantle. But today for our lecture, Sign and Symbol, I want us to look a little bit higher. And on this top row of carvings by Kirschmeier, we see in the center, 1918, the year the room was uh, built. And on the left, a portrait of Ellen Scripps Booth. On the right, a portrait of George Goff Booth. Now, to Ellen's left are her parents, James uh, uh, and Harriet. And James was one of the co-founders with his siblings of the Detroit Evening News. And the Scripps family had immigrated from England to North America in 1844. On the left is the Scripps family crest or arms. This is our first of our signs and symbols. And the Scripps crest is divided into a blue background with a bright sun and above that a silver background with a horseshoe. The horseshoe represents the horse farm that the family originally settled on in Illinois. And the sun illustrates the enlightenment of the newspaper, which was the family business. Now, if we were really going into the weeds, we could get into the sign and symbols of the various uh, uh, flowers behind them, including the Tudor rose. All of our founders are, are of English uh, ancestry. I just love the sort of detail that Kirschmeier captures in all of his work, whether it's the small flowers, the crest, the portraits, or the sort of ornamental line of birds and leaves up at the top. Now, scooting down the overmantle, we come to George Booth's parents, Henry Wood Booth and Clara Ganger Booth. Now, Henry and Clara uh, are seen here next to the Booth family crest, which was invented by the family when they were here in North America. Coincidentally, the Booths also immigrated in 1844, but settled eventually in Canada. And at some point in the 19th century, the Booths adapted this as their family crest. The blue symbolizes loyalty and truth. The gold chevron, which resembles a roof, represents protection and worthy accomplishment. And the gold color of the chevron symbolizes generosity as well as elevation of the mind. The chevron also at times is interpreted as representing a hill, a, a, a symbol of determination, and reflecting the Booth's rather difficult life from their immigrant uh, uh, roots in their early days in North America. Then there are the three gold bees. Uh, if you know Cranbrook, you know that we love bees. Uh, they're everywhere around Cranbrook House and the campus. And the bees symbolized for the booths efficient industry. Uh, they symbolized uh, seeking out what was beautiful, the receiving receiving of sweet and nourish, uh, nourishing products, and the way that the booth sort of works and uh, vital to all life, connecting flowers and nature. The family motto as, de as devised by Henry Goff Booth, George's grandfather, is look to the bees and follow. Now, sometimes you'll see a little shell over the crest. There's not one here. Shell, the shell often represents Christ, the living water. So we have here in the overmantle the Scripps family crest at top left, the Booth family crest top right, and then in the center is a parade of craftsmen anchored by an Episcopal bishop. He is anointing the architect, Albert Kahn, and then behind Kahn is the silversmith, the, cap the blacksmith, the window maker. And to the left, you see a ceramics artist, a weaver, a glass blower, and most importantly, a portrait of John Kirschmeyer himself. Now, the arts and crafts were deeply important to the booths. That's why they have these sort of artisans arranged around their fireplace. But Kirschmeyer uh, uh, has a, an even longer relationship with the booths than simply carving this fireplace in, a, uh, in the Cranbrook House Library. He also does work at Brookside and at Christchurch Cranbrook. He does work throughout Detroit churches. And most importantly to our tour today, he does all the wood paneling for the Oak Room, which takes its name from this distinguished uh, uh, and really sort of dominating pattern of medieval 14th and 15th sty century style English or Northern European oak paneling. Now, the majority of the panels are what we call linen fold, a style of relief carving used to decorate wood paneling, which imitates at sometimes window tracery, other times stiffly folded 
uh, linen. The uh, original Latin name of this carving was uh, wavy wood, uh, and it has this sort of wonderfully rich pattern that catches the light as uh, sort of sun moves across the day. This pattern was popular before the 16th century. It went out of style in the Renaissance, but with the arts and crafts, linen fold came back in vogue, as well as with the Tudor and Gothics revival. Now I want you to look from the linen fold main panels up here to the top panels, and these themselves are our cartouches, which if you join today's program having no idea what the word cartouche meant, I don't blame you and thank you for purchasing a ticket. Uh, the cartouche as a term uh, and as a form may have developed in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs where flattened oval shapes were used to frame the hieroglyphic royal names of Egyptian uh, pharaohs on tombs and monuments. As developed in uh, the 16th century in Europe, cartouches came to be known as elaborate, often scrolled frames. They could appear in architecture, in interior design, on silver or ceramics, and in books and in printed materials. So cartouches are essentially frames, uh, uh, and they can be in any number of style. Here, a pretty beautiful 1636 uh, London Rococo style cartouche from the Winterthur Library, or here a German cartouche, uh, uh, which is framing the words architecture. And I love this one because you have not only sort of double cartouches, you have a frame here, you have another little frame here, but you also see the ability of cartouches to not just be decorative, to have strap work and scrolls, but to also have little icons Icons. So the word architecture is the center, but then there are architectural tools in the corner. And then there are also these human figures that their clothing and arms sort of become the architectural frame and their hats are little buildings. Now, cartouches were probably most in style in the 16th century when designers like Hans Vriedman de Vries did this cartouche, which is in the Rijksmuseum collection, where you see a combination of mythical creatures, humans, and animals within a strapwork frame. Now, strapwork is a type of decoration which mimics the appearance of curled and intertwined bands of leather or sheet metal. And this sort of 16th century strap work cartouche could be a frame for anything, a name, a painting, a crest, for instance, how about a Booth family crest? And this is the sort of origin of the cartouches that ring the oak room ceiling. Or, or the upper level. And as we look at the cartouches, there's a little element that we won't be focusing on on our tour today, which is the strap work itself. And it is different from cartouche to cartouche. We're going to, in just a moment, move into discussing these paintings. But before we get there, I just want to highlight in the top left corner of each cartouche is a different head of an animal or human. So the next time you're in the Oak Room for a tour with the House and Gardens or for a meeting here at Cranbrook, take a look at some of these little heads. And I show you here the diversity from elephants to soldiers uh, to, to sort of mythical beasts and creatures. And the reason all of these cartouches have different little uh, heads on them is the result of Henry Scripps Booth, who is the youngest son uh, and fourth child of five of George and Ellen Booth. And Harry Booth is really the sort of hero of our story today. Uh, Henry Scripps Booth, who went by Harry, uh, throughout his life was deeply committed to advancing, preserving, and growing the Cranbrook institutions established by his parents. He was a natural archivist who seemed to save every photograph, scrap of paper, letter, and receipt. And those form some of the initial collections of Cranbrook archives, which Harry helped to establish. Today, the archives are part of the Center for Collections and Research, and it's in the archives where Harry Booth's monumental history, a history of Cranbrook that is unpublished and largely unedited, uh, account of the story of Cranbrook. The history is where I've pulled many of the stories that we'll hear today and how we have such rich color to add to our cartouches. And I want to start uh, here with one quote from the history, where Harry wrote that in early December 1910, 1920, the Oak Room paneling arrived from Ross and Company in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Kirschmeyer worked for Ross and Company. 
On a visit there, while carving was going on, I suggested that the carvers have fun creating a variety of heads which appear adjacent to the cartouches in the top panels. They took the hint. At the time, no one thought the cartouches would eventually be emblazoned with the symbols of Cranbrook events. And as we see in this photograph of the Oak Room today, these cartouches, the strap work frames, did become emblazoned with some 42 different paintings that commemorate various Cranbrook events. It really is Harry who we have to thank for the cartouches. And to tell us more about Harry and about the first five cartouches, I'd like to invite Camille Breen to the screen. Thank you, Kevin. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Camille Breen, a docent with the Cranbrook House and Gardens Auxiliary. The year the first cartouches were painted in the Oak Room, 1922, was a pivotal one in Harry Booth's life. He was maturing into adulthood and finishing up his third year of architecture school at the University of Michigan. In, the, in late 1922, Harry would embark on a 10-month grand tour to study and sketch the great monuments of Europe. Just two years later, Harry would finish school, start his own architecture firm, marry Carolyn Farr, design and build their lovely home, Thornley, and become a father. But in 1922, all this was in the future. His childhood must have seemed much closer. We know from his writings and photo albums that the early 1920s were a time of great energy and excitement for Harry with days spent on adventures with siblings and cousins and time well spent gallivanting with his university friends. With his family and friends at the ready, Harry Booth har hardly needed an excuse to throw a costume party, parade, or amateur play. Throughout his life, he marked birthdays and holidays through ceremony, creating lasting memories and close personal bonds. So it was that in 1922, Harry Booth found himself reminiscing about the events that had recently taken place in the Oak Room. Perhaps with some nostalgia, he picked up his paints and brushes and began to mark these occasions directly on the wall. When Harry climbed up the ladder to reach the oak paneling, he did have some training as an artist. Remember, at that time he was studying architecture and as an architecture student, he would have been required to produce large, beautiful building plans and renderings in ink and watercolors. He applied these same skills of draftsmanship and illustration to produce the cartouches. First, Harry painted a Christmas tree commemorating the completion of the Oak Room just in time for Christmas 1920. This was the only time the family celebrated Christmas in the Oak Room, and in the cartouche we can see the Christmas tree aglow with candles and sparkling baubles while the Star of Bethlehem stands against a dark background above. Next, a cartouche with Greek, with Greek letters Sigma Gamma the Sigma Ga Gamma Association was a Detroit-based charity supported by many members of the Booth family and their social circle. Sigma Gamma mainly focused on, uh, it was a clinic and convalescent home for children needing orthopedic surgery and treatment. In 1921, George and Ellen's daughter, Florence Booth, invited the children of Sigma Gamma to Cranbrook for a day in the country consisting of a picnic lunch, hay rides, and time with the family, dogs, and horses. This cartouche, which Harry described as the ups and downs of married life, commemorates a dinner given before his older brother Warren Booth's wedding to Alice Newcomb in 1921. A red bell is painted below, while above a silver, a silver bowl of fruit sits between two glowing candles. Next, a cartouche commemorating a party held on September 17, 1921, celebrating a double engagement of family friends. On the top part are painted the initials of Ruth Raymond and her betrothed, 
uh, Norton Ives. On the lower heart are the initials of Margaret Booth, a second cousin, and her love, Fraser Whitehead. The night of the engagement party began with a sit-down dinner for 34 guests in the Oak Room. The dinner, as Harry remembered, featured good orthodox party food except for the salad, which he recalled took, him, took Harry and his sister Florence over three hours to prepare. Their salad creation was, for some unknown reason, served in the form of a porcupine. The dinner was followed by a showing of the silent film Wedding Bells projected onto a large screen on the courtyard terrace. After the movie, it was back into the Oak Room for dancing to music from the old Ampico player piano. The last of the first five cartouches is this charming depiction of what appears to be an antebellum mother in her hoop skirt walking with her daughter. This cartouche is in fact celebrating a mother, but that's not exactly what Harry, who Harry painted. The event commemorated here uh, happened on July 10th, 1921, when Harry attempted to throw his mother Ellen a surprise 58th birthday party. The surprise was ruined when an hour before the event was to begin, Ellen slipped downstairs into the Cranbrook House kitchen and found the staff busily making a cake and dinner for 22 guests. While Helen may have while Ellen may have discovered the unexpected dinner too soon, she was still quite surprised when the 20 or so guests arrived at Cranbrook House in costumes from the 1870s, the clothing of her childhood. One guest made a great impression, a stout member of the Newcomb family who was very polite and elegant in her hoop skirt, but too shy to utter a word. It turned out to be Mr. Serenius Adelbert Newcomb Jr. who had shaved off his mustache and dressed up in an elegant lady as, a, as an elegant lady of a former era. The next year, Harry commemorated his mother's surprise costume party by painting Mr. Newcomb in his drag. And so with these five paintings, Harry Booth started the tradition of marking events that took place in Cranbrook House on the walls of the Oak Room. In this photograph, taken on Christmas Day, 1936, George and Ellen sit with their grandchildren beneath the first five cartouches. As the family grew and Cranbrook developed, many more of the blank cartouches of the Oak Room would be filled in. Thank you, Camille, and what a tale that is about Mr. Newcomb and his hoop skirt. Uh, it's pretty shocking to me that we don't have a picture of that party, considering how well documented uh, Harry, uh, his life was and his times at Cranbrook. Um, but I think the cartouche does an excellent job of marking the event. Now, once these first five cartouches were painted here in the Oak Room, new ones continued to be added across the decades. It's unclear from the archival record who painted the other cartouches, but they continue along the same themes as the first five that Harry painted in 1922. Family milestones, parties, and work with charities and community organizations. We won't be going in order around the room. Instead, I've grouped the cartouches into categories. I'd like to next invite Judy Lindstrom, Chair of the Gardens, uh, on screen to talk about some of the next cartouches, those commemorating Booth family weddings, birthdays, debutantes, and anniversaries. Judy, take it away. Thank you, Kevin, and good afternoon, everyone. While the first cartouches were all painted to commemorate events from just 1920 to 1922, soon the family marked events older than the Oak Room itself. In 1914, George and Ellen's daughter, Grace Ellen Booth, married Harold Lindsay Wallace. The ceremony was in the Cranbrook House living room, and a decade later, this large W commemorated the union. The symbolism of this cartouche commemorating the wedding of George and Ellen's sons Warren Booth to Alice Newcomb in 1921 is a little more elaborate. On the right are three rabbits, a play on the name of Warren and a rabbit's underground home. 
Behind the Bunnies is a stylized newspaper. Warren Booth was the third generation of his family to enter the newspaper business and served as president of the Evening News Association and of Booth Newspapers. On the left side of the cartouche, his bride, Alice Newcomb, is represented by an unrolling bolt of white fabric. Her family business was a Newcomb Endicott Company department store. Her father was the store's president, and I should add, he was also the lovely lady painted on Ellen Booth's surprise birthday party cartouche. Up next, a Great Lakes freighter, the Carolyn Farr, representing the pre-wedding party held at Cranbrook House before the marriage of Carol and Harry Booth in 1924. Why a freighter, which might not be the most romantic or elegant of ships? Carol's father, Merton Farr, ran a major Great Lakes shipping enterprise and named ships after his daughters and family. In later years, Harry and, his, Harry and Carol's children would head down to the Detroit River and wait to see their mother's ship motor by. These two figures dancing the Charleston commemorate the debutante ball held in Cranbrook House Library for George and Ellen's youngest daughter, Florence Louise Booth. Her debut was held on her lucky day, Friday, October 13th. A 15-piece orchestra played while dahlias and grapes from the Cranbrook Greenhouse decked the tables. On the cartouche, I truly love her drop waist flapper dress, pearls, and headband, and his full tuxedo with tails. Even the pale yellow painted background seems to be in on the dance with its upswept, upswept feather design. From her debutante cartouche, she moved to Florence's wedding cartouche, where the symbolism is even more rich. The tent symbolizes Florence, Florence Booth, an interpretation of the family name for its more basic meaning, Booth, as in stall or tent. The booth seen here looks like a tent you'd find in a country fair. Notice the flag atop the tent. It features the Booth family crest, which Kevin described earlier. While it might look like bacon if you're hungry, the wavy red and white lines represent the Rouge River that runs through the Cranbrook estate. The bear fording the river is a play on the surname of Florence's husband, James Beresford. Florence and James' wedding took place on February 7, 1925 in the Cranbrook House Library. The rehearsal dinner had taken place in the Oak Room two nights before, and the highlight of that dinner was the gift of a new, modern device, an electric mixer. The shiny new mixer attracted so much attention among the guests, a dramatic demonstration was staged with hot water and powdered shaving soap. If only the rehearsal dinner had had a cartouche. Now, George and Ellen had five children, and we've seen four weddings here. For whatever reason, eldest son, James, and his wife, Jean, never received a cartouche. And it was such a shame, as James was an extremely talented painter and could easily have added himself to the walls. Instead, we arrive at the wedding of Jean and James' second daughter, Anne Louise Booth, to Oscar Skinner. Anne's A and Oscar's O surround a sculptural S for Skinner. This is the only grandchild of Cranbrook's founders honored on a cartouche. And we saw a moment ago that George and Ellen had quite a few grandchildren. So why are Anne and Oscar here? Well, on January 6, 1939, Anne and Oscar were married at Cranbrook House. Also from the late 1930s is this cartouche commemorating the golden anniversary of George and Ellen Booth. Married in Detroit on June 1, 1887, 50 years later, Cranbrook House played host to an elaborate celebration for the happy couple. The cartouche shows two doves, which are symbols of mercy and peace, holding a laurel wreath in their beaks, a symbol of joy and triumph, and all underneath a golden sun. Below G for George and E for Ellen sit atop their respective crests. This cartouche was painted by a Cranbrook Academy of Art artist. Beyond weddings and anniversaries, however, there were also a few birthdays commemorated in the cartouches. This cartouche celebrates the 80th birthday celebration of Henry Wood Booth, George's father in 1917. Notice the two Bs here representing Henry's lineage as a second generation Booth in North America. He immigrated from the village of Cranbrook, England at the age of seven. If Henry Wood Booth's 80th birthday was a formal cartouche, well, Ellen's mother's 80th birthday cartouche is much more, shall I say, dynamic. Commemorating Harriet's Josephine Messenger scripts, Ellen Booth's mother, the cartouche depicts Harriet as a sprinter in Grecian dress, torch in one hand and scroll in the other. Around her are the horseshoe and rising sun from the script's family crest. Harry wrote of the party thrown at Cranbrook House for his grandmother on December 31st, 1918, quote, 
It was the 80th birthday of a jolly little lady who was always ready to do anything from walking the tops of the walls to riding in an airplane back when you could see the ground between your feet, end quote. And while this cartouche might not be the exact likeness of Harriet 80, it certainly captured her spirit. And now back to you, Kevin. Thank you, Judy. I hope I look that great at 80. <laughs> Um, now, as we continue on our journey around the Oak Room and its cartouches and their signs and symbols, we're going to move forward away from the sort of uh, uh, early family history and into the mid 20th century. While my research shows that most of the next cartouches were painted at the behest or instruction of Harry Booth, it's not always clear how topics were chosen, when they were added, or who was the artist, though according to Harry, most of the artists were Academy of Art students. So one of the uh, next cartouches commemorates the centennial of our founder's birth. George Booth was born in Toronto uh, uh, on September 24th, 1864. And although he died at the age of 85, the Cranbrook community celebrated his 100th anniversary his birthday, his centennial, with an elaborate party and rocket display over Kingswood Lake. Called the Centennial Salute, students and faculty gathered on the North Terrace of Cranbrook House with members of the family. I mentioned that Harry loved ceremony and look at all of the beautiful institutions flags. The names of the six Cranbrook institutions were called out in the order of their founding and three rocket bursts no, uh, burst out as a tribute uh, after each name. If you add in the Cranbrook Foundation, the net result was a 21 gun salute. Now, Harry Bo Booth wrote in his history that it was not a shot heard around the world, for George Booth had already had a silent international influence. And here are some children looking up at the 21-gun rocket salute. Next is one of my favorite cartouches. This crest was developed and used by George Booth to represent the six institutions he and Ellen established at Cranbrook, three schools, an art academy, and its museum, a science institute, and an Episcopal church. Cranbrook, which may be Old English for where the crane lands, is each of these institutions is then represented by a crane. At the center is again the Booth family crest sitting on a flowing red line, again representing the Rouge River that flows through campus. Now, the Oak Room has for many decades served as the primary meeting or conference room for Cranbrook's institutions, and it is fitting to have our community crest adapted to a cartouche. Look at those six cranes standing augustly together in harmony, like the six institutions of Cranbrook working healthily together. Intriguingly, there is an almost identical cartouche on the opposite side of the room. But on this version, the cranes are significantly less regal. Perhaps they're just having fun, but as I see it, this is a commentary on the occasional internecine battles between the different program areas at Cranbrook. Adding to this sort of frenetic fighting energy among the cranes is the ominous border, which is called a bordure indented in heraldry. It's traditionally used in arms design to signify either younger sons or more ominously illegitimate sons. The jagged border certainly adds to the sense of mayhem. My interpretation that the cranes are squabbling may be supported by this cartouche's location, sitting in a far corner of the Oak Room in Time Out on the very smallest of the cartouches. Time Out for those misbehaving cranes. Now, the institutions are further represented in independent cartouches, like this one for Christchurch Cranbrook. It doesn't just represent the institution, however, but a specific reception held in late 1925 honoring Christchurch Cranbrook's first record, rector, Samuel Simpson Marquis, and his wife, Gertrude Lee Marquis. The cartouche is adapted from the church's arms, developed in the Booth era and still used today. The white background represents peace and serenity. The red cross is the cross of St. George, patron saint of England. The red symbolizes martyrdom and being of great mind and heart, and the cross of St. George is both on the Union Jack, and remember the Booths were English immigrants, and is also on the crest of the National Episcopal Church, which is, of course, in England, the Church of England. The red wavy lines against the uh, white background again tie the church to its location alongside the Rouge River, and then the Booth crest is in the upper left, 
as the Booths were the founder of the parish. Nearby is this another cartouche relating to the church. For many years, the Oak Room served as the pre-3 nursery during church hours. You can see the church arms above and then the children playing below. The uh, photograph to the right shows Dr. Marquis with the strong children and the Grace Booth Wallace family standing outside the meeting house where Christ Church Cranbrook services were held in the earliest years. Now the next cartouche is the Kingswood cartouche, the only other institution to have its own cartouche. And this commemorates not the founding of Kingswood School by Ellen, but by the annual holiday Christmas breakfast that Ellen hosted here at Cranbrook House for many years in the 1930s and 40s. The brunch eventually, still hosted by Ellen, moved to the Kingswood dining hall, seemed here. But it's fascinating to read in Ellen's diaries how concerned she was that the boarding students who would be spending their Christmas day in the dormitories at Kingswood would have enough to eat and enough fresh squeezed orange juice. The cartouche itself shows an oak tree with strong roots growing through a crown. This is the original seal that grew out of a need to emboss the first diplomas in 1932. Lee White, secretary of the Kingswood School and a personal friend of George Booth, presented a drawing of a tree encircled with a crown and a motto in Latin. The board approved the tree, but some directors objected to the lot Latin, and now the crest reads, enter to learn, go forth to serve. The design that we see in the cartouche was also adapted by Marshall Fredericks and placed into the ground in front of Kingswood School. Next is a cartouche commemorating a meeting of the American Federation of the Arts at Cranbrook House. George Booth was president of the American Federation of the Arts in 1920. And if you don't know the Federation, perhaps you know some of its products like Who's Who in American Art, the Magazine of Art, or the American Art Directory. The organization was established in 1909 by Secretary of State Elihu Root, uh, Root and President Teddy Roosevelt as a way of bringing museums and art to the people through traveling shows, educational programs, and publications. It's fascinating that in 1920, when George Booth was president, the Federation was instrumental in organizing a lobbying campaign for the development of a National Gallery of Art. This was eventually realized when the National Gallery of Art opened in 1941. Certainly, the American Federation of the Arts embodied the ideals that inspired the Booths to build Cranbrook. Now, these serene white tulips hide the rambunctious event which they commemorate, the visit to Cranbrook by 500 members of the Garden Club of America during their national convention in Detroit in June of 1925. The group was invited to afternoon tea, but arrived hours early only to find that the house nor the host were ready to receive them. The Garden Club ladies were undeterred and began touring Cranbrook House, still very much a private residence, on their own. They opened wardrobes and closets and even tried to get into the rooms where George and Ellen were speedily dressing. All this trouble and the gardens were an in-between season slump with hardly anything in bloom. The guests reportedly showed no interest in the gardens or fountains and were instead only fascinated by what they found in Cranbrook House's still room, Loya Sarnen's beautiful model for the development of the Art Academy. Now, none of the Academy's buildings had been built yet. This was 1925, before any of the Cranbrook institutions had opened. And the Garden Club simply plied the booths with questions about the new endeavor. The next cartouche represents one of the many ideas for what would happen to Cranbrook after our Cranbrook house after the Booth's passing. George and Ellen were concerned about this some 40,000 square foot home and how it could contribute to the community of institutions they had established. After renovating the third floor and adding public restrooms, the Church Society for College Work, founded in 1935, moved into Cranbrook House in 1945. It stayed here for three years during World War II before it relocated to Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Church Society for College Work, whose crest is seen here, uh, promoted Christianity and uh, the Protestant Episcopal Church in college and university centers. Now, 
with these cartouches shared, I'd like to uh, invite our next House and Garden speaker, Randy Forrester, to tell us about some of the cartouches added to the Oak Room since 19, for events that took place since 1949. Randy? Thank you, Kevin. And I'm delighted to be here with all of you today. In the first year after George Booth's death, in order to bring festive cheer into Cramper House at the holidays, Harry Booth restarted a memorandum, a moribund Cramper tradition, Twelfth Night. For Harry, the event traced its roots back to December 22nd, 1919, when family and friends attended Shakespeare's comedy, Twelfth Night, at the Schubert Detroit Opera House. This play inspired Harry to throw a costume party at the Cranbrook Architectural Office in 1929, celebrating the epiphany, the 12th night after Christmas, with revelry and fun. Starting on January 6, 1950, and continuing until 1989, Cranbrook House played host to Harry's elaborate 12th night event. Bringing together family and staff from across all of Cranbrook's programs, Harry was both host and MC and provided entertainment as well as traditional refreshments of plum pudding, eggnog, and sherry. Here you can see guests to the 1964 celebration enjoying eggnog beneath the cartouches of the Oak Room. Twelfth Night included a reading and reenactment of the Christmas story and an amateur mummery play or pantomime satirizing the year's major events on campus and around the world. Staff and guests from all of the Cranbrook institutions participated, as well as members of the Booth family. Twelfth Night is immortalized in this cartouche with the Star of Wonder rising above Bethlehem. Around the same time as the first Twelfth Night, Harry Booth began staging music events in Cranbrook House. In February, 1952, the Cranbrook Music Guild was established. The Guild held concerts at the house and around the campus for decades. The Guild is represented through two ancient instruments, the harp and the lyre, with a rising sun behind them. In 1957, the Institute of Pastoral Studies was established by Christ Church Cranbrook and located on the third floor of Cranbrook House. The Institute was there until 1981 when it moved to Mary Grove College in Detroit. Here, the shepherd's crook, a Christian symbol of God's spirit and guidance, is fronted by I-H-N for In His Name. This cartouche, featuring the Booth family arms, commemorates the gift of Cranbrook House to the Cranbrook Foundation and marks 50 years since the completion of Cranbrook House. Similarly, this cartouche shows the house's front door and was painted to commemorate not just the 50th anniversary of the house, but the reception thrown for that occasion. A party is always an excellent excuse to paint a cartouche. The next four cartouches were painted by Cranbrook Academy of Art design student Joseph Ford in the spring of 1971. First, an acorn marking 25 years of the Oakland Citizens League, a civic leadership organization established at Cranbrook in 1938 and in the 1970s, based out of Harry Booth's Thornley Studio. The oak tree has been a symbol of physical strength and vigor since ancient times. And while the acorn traditionally represented lust and inactivity, as acorns were used for pig feed, here on the cartouche, our acorn embodies the potential for growth of Cranbrook's home, Oakland County. Next, a cartouche reminiscent of a blueprint commemorating a visit of international architects to Cranbrook House. The acronym UIA may refer to the International Union of Architects, an organization with members in the Detroit area. These tragedy and comedy masks represent the 1966 visit of Dame Judith Anderson to Cranbrook Summer Theatre School. The Australian-born actor was a star of stage and screen. Perhaps you know her as Mrs. Danvers from Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca. 
The last cartouche painted by Joseph Ford celebrates the Cranbrook Writers Guild, established by Governor George Romney through the Michigan Council of the Arts and first led by Carl Wamberger. The, the Writers Guild staged conferences and retreats at Cranbrook to promote poetry and prose in Michigan from 1967 to 2008. Harry designed the logo seen at the bottom of the cartouche with a wide C ending with a W and G. Above the logo, a very 1970s illustration of a hand and quill busily writing. One more event from this period is captured on this cartouche. The September 1961 hosting of the National General Convention of the Episcopal Church in Detroit is commemorated by this painting of the Episcopal Church crest and globe. For the occasion, a special exhibition of modern American religious art was arranged at Cranbrook Art Museum, historic objects put on display at Christchurch Cranbrook, and on September 22nd, a large reception at Cranbrook House for all of the bishops of the church. And now to the two cartouches that are closest to my heart, those marking the establishment of Cranbrook Gardens Auxiliary and Cranbrook House Auxiliary. For many years after George Booth's death in 1948, there was debate about the future of Cranbrook House. It seemed every institution, from the church to the art academy to the Institute of Science, wanted to use the house or the land underneath it. In 1971, Harry Booth and concerned members of the community organized a gardens auxiliary with intentions to preserve, maintain, and share the 40-acre estate with the public. The cartouche depicts the 19th century Italian marble wishing well with iron art that sits on the northeast terrace of the house. Next, in 1974, the Cranbrook House Auxiliary was formed to assist in preserving and maintaining the Booth's historic manor home. The house had just become the central offices of the recently organized Cranbrook Educational Community and the first floor was to remain a historic house museum in the Cranbrook event space. You can see here Cranbrook's first archivist and founding member of the auxiliary, Cora Joyce Rouse, with Harry at an early event. This cartouche shows a wintry Cranbrook house sitting atop an elephant. No, we aren't really at the zoo. This is the magnificent 19th century German-made Kaiser Pewter Center Bowl or wine cooler from the Booth family collection on permanent view in the Cranbrook House dining room. The two volunteer groups joined in 1977 to become Cranbrook House and Gardens Auxiliary with each section retaining its own board of directors. 30 years later, January 31st, 2007, the two sections merged into one board with goals unchanged. As Helen noted earlier, 2021 marks 50 years of preservation, maintenance, and stewardship of the Booth Estate by the House and Gardens Auxiliary. We are proud of our first 50 years of hard work and looking forward to the next 50. Thank you, Randy, for sharing those cartouches. And we've come to our last four cartouches, which are going to bring us up to the 1980s and 1990s. Now, one thing that you've noticed about all these cartouches is the thread that links them together being Harry Booth. Harry really helped in those years where it was unclear what would happen to Cranbrook House. Uh, Harry helped to activate the spaces, welcoming garden clubs and music groups and all of those things that Randy just discussed. But he also helped advocate on behalf of the house that it should not be torn down uh, or otherwise gutted, both proposals that came not from someone outside of Cranbrook House, but from George Booth himself. And so it's Harry that links together these cartouches, and as we continue to look at, uh, at the later ones, we'll see that the common thread is events that are anchored here at Cranbrook House. So our last four cartouches 
include Harry's 90th birthday. The Booth genes are very strong and all of the Booth men lived quite into their elder years. And so here we see Harry Booth's birthday represented by a thistle. Now, why a thistle? It was Harry's nom de plume. Way back when he was an adolescent, he caught a, a fever or a flu and he wasn't able to shave. Uh, his beard was not quite coming in uh, uh, fully, and so his sister Florence looked at him and said, hey, you look like a thistle. And that became his name as he uh, uh, spent a lifetime writing poems, psalms, painting, uh, and sort of anything artistic that Harry did, he did under the name of Thistle. Now, his 90th birthday, you can see him there with the many members of his uh, uh, five children and their children gathered on the steps of Cranbrook Art Museum. The next cartouche is a little bit older, uh, this one from 1962, but I've placed it here for what it represents. This is another one of our sort of riddle cartouches where what exactly is going on here? At the center, you see a burr and it's down in a valley or a dell. And so the burr in dell is honoring a reception that was held for Dr. and Mrs. Edwin Sharps Burdell. And Dr. Bar uh, Burdell was a foundation advisor. He was a classmate of Harry Booth at the Asheville School where Harry had gone to high school. Uh, and he had served for many years as an advisor and employee of educational institutions. Uh, he worked at Ohio State, MIT, Cooper Union, the Technical University in Ankara, Turkey. And Harry Booth invited him to Cranbrook in 1962 to start conversations about combining the six independent institutions into possibly one institution or three institutions. And so it was under the leadership and advisement of Dr. Burdell that we came over the next 10 years from his visit in 62 to its formation in 73, one Cranbrook, one Cranbrook educational community. And when the community was established, we also developed the position of president of Cranbrook. And our one of our most important presidents and our current president emeritus was Dr. Lillian Bowder. Uh, Dr. Bowder came from the University of Detroit Mercy uh, to be head of schools at Cranbrook, and she was promoted into the position of president in 1983. This cartouche was added on the occasion of her 10th anniversary, and it depicts a project that she is breaking ground on in the photo at right. Uh, with her spade, she is turning over the earth uh, to construct the new Woodward Avenue entrance, the arrival or the entrance feature designed by architect and residents Dan Hoffman. Now, Dr. Bowder not only built this project and the road that linked to together Cranbrook's institutions, she also oversaw the design and construction of the Cranbrook Natatorium, the new studios building, the Institute of Science edition, and the Early Childhood Center. Her 10th anniversary celebration must have been quite a fete. There was an exhibit here at Cranbrook House in the uh, reception hall. And the only photo I found of a cartouche not behaving like a cartouche, where here she has her framed design before it has been rendered by the um, as yet uncovered artist from her sort of sketch onto the wall. And our final cartouche is also related to Dr. Bowder. Here, the cartouche that was painted on the occasion of Dr. Bowder becoming Cranbrook's first president emeritus. The LB stands for Lillian Bowder. And then in the center is a new Cran one Cranbrook seal. We saw the six cranes and the six fighting cranes. Uh, now we have a single Cranbrook and a single Cranbrook logo designed by Catherine McCoy, head of design at Cranbrook Academy of Art from the 70s to the 1990s. This design was created in the early 1990s and it features a perfectly round C adapted from the Cranbrook Academy of Art logo by Aliel Saarinen. And within that round C is the form of a crane. And notice that the crane is standing in three wavy lines. Yet another allusion back to the River Rouge, a Rouge River. Uh, but this time those three lines symbolize the three divisions or program areas of modern Cranbrook, art, science, and education are schools. With that, we have made it around the Oak Room cartouches. 
Now, when we set out to think of what holiday program the Center and the House and Gardens could collaborate on this year, we turned to the cartouches because, as I think you've seen today, not only do some of them directly relate to Christmas and other winter holidays, but there's a great sense of joy and celebration and ceremony that links together all of these cartouches from events that occurred in 1914 to 1996. And I am thrilled now to invite back onto the screen the director of the Center for Collections and Research, Greg Whitcomb, who will introduce two new cartouches. Thank you, Kevin. No matter how much I think I know about Cranbrook, there is so much more to learn, and today was no exception. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Camille, Judy, and Randy, for sharing these stories with all of us today. We often describe Cranbrook House as a living museum, a home where it is both a privilege and an honor to continue the traditions that our founders started during their lifetimes. From the concerts and dinners we often host in the library to the more intimate lectures, meetings and retreats that take place in the Oak Room, and I might add, more than an occasional staff holiday party, Cranbrook House remains a vibrant and dynamic space, the heart and soul of the entire educational community. It is in the spirit of keeping the traditions of the house alive that I am thrilled to announce that this year we will be adding two new cartouches to the Oak Room. The first will mark the remarkable tenure of Cranbrook's eighth president, Dominic DeMarco. Although Cranbrook has had nine presidents, including our new president, Amy Claire Roche, we have had just two on whom the Board of Trustees have bestowed the title President Emeritus for their distinguished service, Dr. Lillian Bauder and Dominic DeMarco. The second new cartouche will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the organization that has worked to lovingly and beautifully maintain and share our founder's home, Cranbrook House and Gardens Auxiliary. Helen, thank you for all you and your board members and 400 volunteers do to ensure that this estate remains the heart and soul of Cranbrook, a place where we all can continue to share and create traditions and memories. At this moment, all I can say is watch this space for more information about these two new cartouches. Kevin, I'm going to turn the podium back to you to see if any of our audience members have any questions for you or our speakers. Thank you, Greg, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, the chat feature is disabled, so today what I'll ask people to do if you have questions, you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, I did receive one question by text message, uh, which was, uh, uh, what are the sort of lines on the cartouches in the woodwork? So I'll pull this this one up to show it. And I think what this obviously close personal friend was asking uh, is what are these sort of um, uh, marks down here? This is called Rayfleck, uh, and this is actually coming from the oak wood itself. Uh, George Booth demanded that Kirschmeyer carve all of the paneling at Cranbrook House in uh, Ray Fleck wood. And when you are milling lumber, when you are uh, sort of taking it from a tree to a piece of wood, uh, you're going to have different grains that are exposed. And Ray Fleck will appear on four cuts of wood. It is bisecting across the grain instead of showing us that more typical front grain. Uh, and so it is expensive. Every tree has it. That doesn't mean the rest of the tree wasn't used. It just wasn't used at Cranbrook House. Uh, it's something that if you have a sunny day or a flashlight, you will find that every piece of uh, wood paneling within Cranbrook House, whether it is from our first wood carver, Joaquin Youngworth, or whether it's from Kirschmeyer in the additions, uh, it's always Ray Flecked. And just one other thing to add about the carving, George Booth thought that the carving was way too flat in the Oak Room. He sent a pretty nasty letter off to Kirschmeyer about uh, Kirschmeyer basically not knowing how to control his assistants in that if George Booth was paying for Kirschmeyer to carve the wood, maybe Kirschmeyer should pick up his chisel and do it because George could tell what he had done versus his assistants. And so here at the Oak Room, George 
says, I want you to carve this, but you better carve it deep. I better see those shadow lines. And so there is this sort of overly aggressive carving that's going on on the panels. And I think in some of the beautiful photographs, uh, you could even see how the painting was actually catching the light because of those gouge marks that come from the 1920 carving uh, that then the painting is sitting on top of the chisel marks. I should add, I do want to thank Tris Red, who is an Academy of Art photography student and the center student employee who photographed all the cartouches here. Now, does anyone have a question? You're welcome to unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, Jules Pieri, I'm uh, calling in from Boston and kind of a basic question. How many spaces are left for new cartouches? More than you would think. Greg might have the exact number in front of him. Um, it's approximately 20. 20. The other thing is, is that the cartouches also run on the window sills, so you could do ceiling cartouches. Um, and then there are also cartouches in the corners. So the, the, the fighting cranes, you may have noticed, is a very small cartouche. Uh, Dr. Bowder, she has one full size and one small cartouche. And what's funny is that as Harry Booth lived on and continued to write his history, um, he got perhaps more and more um, cantankerous in his writings. And there's one late uh, write entry from about 1985 or 86, where he says, I was in the Oak Room today, and I don't know what they're doing with the cartouches. They all seem to be filling up. What's next? They're going to put up Copper Plate Memorial. I don't quite know what he meant about Copper Plate, but the way he wrote it, it was certainly an insult. But the best of my knowledge was when he was in the room last, there were only cartouches that he had overseen the installation of. Um, so it is a real fear, uh, but you'll notice it has been um, uh, some 25 years since we last put up a cartouche. And we did create a document guidelines for adding a cartouche. Currently there were none. And so they, we now have a board approved method of selecting things to be commemorated. And they'll continue to be events that are related here to, if not just the Oak Room, to the Cranbrook House and Estate. Good question. Thank you. Thanks also for all of the work that um, all of you did, the five of you who spoke and, and the person who introduced, but the, the research that you do, Kevin, and, and now the auxiliary as well, it was, you know, it's just incredible. I really appreciate the hard work. Thank you. Thank you. And you would think that with all that's been written about Cranbrook, there would have been a guide to the cartouches already, but that is the happiest outcome of today's um, <laughs> project is that we now have written uh, historical facts about each of these. Um, the one guide there was, was found to have errors. <laughs> Kevin, it's Touché. Brock Landry. Um, again, a great program, but do, do the older cartouches require maintenance? And if so, how do you do that? It's a good question. As you can tell, even from Zoom, uh, the ones that are probably in acrylics here um, uh, from the later date versus the ones that Harry Booth put up, and I'm not sure what kind of paint, they are in very different colors. Um, I know our registrar is on the line, but I'm not sure if she knows. To my knowledge, the cartouches have never been cleaned. Um, mm. I think the ones over the fireplace probably could use some uh, non-invasive cleaning, um, but they are in pretty great shape. You know, the house fluctuates in temperature. It's not air conditioned, though this room now is. And so you may have seen in the photographs that some were split, but that's not really a maintenance issue. That's a natural course of wood as it continues to dry. And so that's not something that we would be overly concerned about. Um, you really cannot see the splits from nine feet below. It's only these high resolution photographs that we, Nina, Trist and I, rolled a ladder around the room and took that you begin to see the cracks. You have the Henry Mercer fireplace that's pretty incredible and it really is getting more into this sort of am I in jolly old England or am I in the suburbs of Detroit uh, revivalism. But I think actually the cartouches being painted fits into this idea of being some sort of ancient ancestral homeland. Other questions? I wondered if uh... First of all, a wonderful program. At Thank Elvis. you. Uh, you do a fantastic job, and the archives are just amazing that you know all this information about each cartouche. Uh, just a marvelous program. I did wonder, though, why there is no mention at all of Saarinen in all of these cartouches. 
Uh, two answers. Uh, uh, it's a great question. I was shocked when the um, the white tulips ended up being that that story was so related to the family of, of the garden tour being usurped by Loya Sarnan's model. Um, you know, the Sarnans were, they were employees of the booths and the booths, this was their family home. And so the 40 acres of the booth estate that the housing gardens manages today really was a very separate world from the Cranbrook institutions. The institutions were six distinct entities. The students did not go between them. The, the boys were not allowed on the Art Academy campus. And if you know the campus well, you'll know that there's nothing between them. I mean, they're they're next to each other. Uh, and so those early years, it really was, there was no central road network. There was no central collaboration. The only thing that connected them was the board of trustees, the, the Cranbrook Foundation. But it was sort of six endowments, six managers, six people mowing the grass. I mean, it was, they were distinct. And so Cranbrook House really was the family's domain in the Saarinen era. So Saarinen uh, steps down from president of the Academy in 42. The same year he opens the art museum, his last great building for Cranbrook. So he's still on campus another eight years uh, and he outlives George Booth by one year. Um, but the events that were painted when Booth and Saarinen were alive were only family events. The events that are commemorated in the 50s, 60s, 70s are Harry Booth events, and they tend to be the secondary Cranbrook projects like the Writers Guild and the Music Guild. Um, uh, because I would think, you know, when I first knew about these cartouches, it was like, oh, well, surely we commemorated the 1983 exhibit Design in America, which really relaunches Cranbrook on an international scene of awareness. Um, you know, having a one institution show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art surely would merit a cartouche. But there really are not events here that did not take place either in this room or on this estate. The other reason is that the Sarnans and the Booths, uh, Harry Booth, uh, he was pretty he was he was less than enchanted by the Sarnans by the end of their run. He thought they got all the fame and his parents did not. And so I can't imagine him uh, painting a tribute to this architect who Aero Sarnan, the Sarnan's son, and Harry Booth got into rather bad loggerheads in the 1950s about the future of this place. So thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions? We have a minute left. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This recording um, will be available on YouTube a little bit later as part of Cranbrook's um, Uncovering Cranbrook series. These are a way for us to bring new stories to you, to bring new uh, audiences into Cranbrook. And we'll continue to sell tickets to this event. Uh, so if you want to share it with anyone, just email us at center at cranbrook.edu. Coming up, the Center has a full lineup of winter programming uh, starting on January 31st with my History of American Architecture lecture series, which will be quite different from today. Uh, we'll be focusing only on the Saarinans and the work of Eero Saarinen and his circle. So in five weeks, we'll talk about Eero Saarinen's, uh, uh, the architects, designers, artists, um, thinkers, critics that he collaborated with in what really defined sort of mid-century modern architecture out of the Eero Saarinen and Associates offices here in Bloomfield Hills. Keep on the uh, center email because you'll see lots more events coming up. Our house party fundraiser in May uh, is one to make sure you have on your calendar on May 22nd. And then, of course, our annual events like the Bowder Lecture and the student shows. If Greg has anything else to add, he can come back on screen. If not, I want to thank everyone so much for joining us today for Sign and Symbol, the Oak Room Cartouches. I want to thank again the House and Gardens volunteers who helped share this story with me, as well as my colleagues in the archives and the Center for Collections and Research for helping me prepare today's talk. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. <laughs>